So today we're going to be talking about food forests. How many of you have heard of a food forest before? Not very many. I'll bet you haven't visited one then either. <laughs> well, a food forest goes way, way back to the old orchards. And I remember my grandpa had an orchard and he had all kinds of fruit trees and grapevines and I don't know what all. And uh, my best friend, their family had a big orchard, mostly apples. But so we're kind of starting with the idea of this whole food forest. You, If it's going to be a forest, you've got to have some trees. And so uh, this is not a conventional orchard where you have row after row of apple trees or something, but a big variety of plants that interact with each other and can provide you with food throughout the whole season, as long as, you know, plants are growing in our climate here. So. A food forest is actually an ecological community. And all the members, all these different kinds of plants interact with each other. And everything that we've talked about so far this year applies to a food forest. So we'll be going back through some of that stuff. So you can see it's built around trees and perennials. And trees take a long time to grow. So this is not something that you're going to accomplish in one year's time. In fact, it's probably going to be decades until this whole food forest is developed into what you hope it will be at some point in time. It also includes fruits and vegetables, herbs, medicinal plants, um, as we've talked about earlier this year, it promotes habitat for beneficial insects, pollinators. Uh, it helps balance the soil nutrient because one plant will contribute a nutrient to the soil that another plant needs to flourish. And it has the goal of replicating ecosystems and growing patterns found in nature. The structure of the forest moderates climates, so you're actually creating a mini climate there. Um, it gathers and stores rainwater, it minimizes soil erosion, and pests and predators are kept in balance. So it's really a cool place. And it's coming out of the whole urban farming movement. So what they call farming, we call gardening because we're growing up, you know, we're, we're living in rural agriculture, big farm. And um, the people in the urban areas are trying to create these gardens so that they have green spaces within their cities and also so that people have fresh food to eat. So urban farming, is like community gardening. A food forest is actually a type of permaculture, which means you plant something and you leave it there. You're not, you know, turning over the soil and planting something different every year. And this is goes way, way back to the beginning times of our country when people were living here. And on the East Coast, which was all the way to, you know, like Wisconsin, heavily forested. But forests have spaces in them. And in those spaces, foods were planted. When we got beyond hunting and gathering, then they would start collecting seeds and planting the things that they liked to eat as long as they weren't, you know, like the Plains Indians moved around a lot. So they weren't gardening as much as these Eastern natives were. They found those seeds and later on they traded them. So the three sisters, corn, squash, and beans, were not part of the culture of the East Coast natives. But they traded those seeds with the Midwest, Southwest uh, natives and started growing them there too. 
and as many parts of the plant as were possible to eat, they ate, including the bark of trees, which might be used for medicines or to make teas. They didn't chew them up, but they, they did use um, the medicinal value of the bark of trees. And willow is where aspirin came from. So uh, we still have these kinds of plants around. Plants were used as pharmaceuticals. Um, and I was just at McCrory Gardens yesterday, and they have a whole medicinal area there where they've got these plants and their label and everything that are growing that, that are native plants of our prairie that can be used as medicines. And then they've got a big poster thing there that gives you the name of each plant and what part of the plant and what it was used for, like digestive upsets and sore muscles and pain. And, you know, one was for the removal of pinworms and other parasites. Can't remember which one that was. I should have written it up, but um, or taken a picture of that particular yeah, one. So in what we're talk, calling a food forest today, it consists of seven layers. We'll be going through each one, and they all work together. So one might climb another one. One might grow in the shade of another one. One you know, might contribute uh, nutrients that another one needs. So all the layers work together. If you walk in an ecosystem near your home. Uh, I have a friend that lives in native, or uh, has a native pasture that has not been grazed for a number of years now, and all the wild plants are coming back. And in every season, it is just beautiful because she's got all these blooming plants. And you go, you know, I've been over there several times and taken pictures of them, and it's just, it's just amazing. In the earliest spring, She's got crocuses everywhere. The hillsides are just purple. And a few weeks ago, it was all echinacea. So again, it was purple, but a different kind of purple. Um, forest landscapes are diverse in culture and species. We don't have any natural forests around here where we live. So I guess we're trying to create some of them. Researchers are still discovering new ways plants communicate. There's an excellent book about how trees communicate. It's really fascinating. They store information. They interact with their environment. In fact, um, there are trees that if they're attacked by an insect, they give off pheromones, chemicals in the air that the other trees pick up on, and they know that they can try to protect themselves from that insect. So, I mean, it's just amazing what we keep learning. Many plants have mechanisms to control their neighbors. So they have compounds in their roots. If you've ever had a black walnut tree, there's not much uh -huh. that you can grow around a black walnut tree because it has this uh, compound and, and that lasts in the soil. Even if you cut the tree down, that compound will last in the soil for years. First 10 years is what John Ball Yeah, mentioned. to keep, to keep other plants from competing with it. Mm -hmm. So. And he's right. It's 10 years. It's got to be 10 years pretty soon. One flower in the middle. Okay, so now we're going to go through our seven layers. Overstory trees, sometimes called a canopy. Um, you can plant for wind bricks to slow your wind. So these are big trees, and conifers are real good at slowing wind. Um, I live out in the wide open country, and you know every farm has its own little shelter belt around it on the west side and the north side to keep the cold north winds from blowing in and drifting, you know, ten foot drifts of snow in your yard. Um, they provide food and shelter for the birds as well. If you are going to plant a large tree, you will want to do all of this stuff I'm talking about today. Before you jump into it, you need to do some research. And it is out there. Um, but large trees, check for its mature size. You don't want to plant them, you know, six feet apart. 
and they get a canopy that's bigger than this room. They're going to be too crowded. So you want to know how tall they're going to get. You want to know how broad they're going to get. And another thing you need to consider is that the roots are going to go out at least as far as the top of the tree, if not farther. So for things that you're planting underneath these trees, that's consideration as well. Um, John Ball's recommendations for large shade trees are heritage oak, Kentucky coffee tree, and northern sentinel honey locust. So we don't want to be planting ash because of the emerald ash borer that will probably be showing up here. And uh, he's concerned about maples because he said we've overplanted maples, way too many maples. And he sees at some point in time we might have a problem with them like the ash borer is right now. So those are three that he recommends as big shade producing trees. The natural forest is a mix of tree species and all different ages. So you'll see new little trees coming up in that forest as well. The first layer, this is the first layer you want to plant because it takes time for a tree to grow. Um, and another type of tree in this in this number one overstory tree are nut trees. They also get large and they provide you with food. But again, not next year. What will grow here? Heart nut, black walnut, hazelnut, um, oak trees will produce acorns and acorns are edible and natives use those to make flour. But Acorns have a lot of tannins in them. That's those things that make your mouth go. And um, so they have to be rinsed, soaked in water through several rinsings of water and then let dry and then you can make them into flour. Um, if you want to plant a hazelnut, you need two because they have to have a cross pollinator. And um, a shag bark hickory is another possibility. It will get nuts after about 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so oh, it's the only one we might see. We're definitely talking about long term here. But um, it was, you know, it's it's fun to have a nut tree. A heart nut is actually a form of walnut, not like a black walnut, but more like an English walnut, and that's what it tastes like. So it's it's pretty have cool. Have you tasted it? Yes. It sounds wonderful. It is. Have you ever that, had a black walnut? They're kind of bitter. I don't like black walnuts. Yeah, they're they're, kind uh, they're of too strong flavor. They have a, you have to be attached to the flavor. Aspers yeah. have a. A nut farm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. west on on Kaiser yeah. off Kaiser Road, yeah. they have a nut farm, and they yeah. have a lot of these. Yeah. He, he has lot. He also had pecans, and they had a fair number of them that would come on, and they had so few at the end of the year that they could name them. <laughs> wow. and everyone had a name. <laughs> I'm, I'm always, what does a heart nut look like? Looks like what a heart. It looks like a heart. It's pointy on the bottom. And, and when you open it up, you know, like a walnut has two halves, they, they're shaped like a heart. That's how they got their name. Yeah. Okay, on, uh, understory trees. These are the ones that are a little bit shorter. And often many that we associate with fruit trees. You can visualize how tall a fruit tree gets. Um, but again, think ahead a de uh, decade because these fruit trees will start very earlier than the nut trees will. They'll, they'll be younger, but not in a couple of years for them either. Apple, pear, cherry, plum, persimmon. Persimmon is supposed to grow here. 
in our in our zone. Um, a standard when when we used to buy trees, you did you just went and bought a tree. You know, you knew what variety you wanted. You bought the tree, but they are all grafted onto rootstocks, and the rootstock is what determines how big the tree is going to be. So if you remember the words standard, semi-dwarf, and dwarf, that's about how tall they're going to get. So the standard tree is the great big tree that you need, you know, a loader or a tractor to get to the top. <laughs> and the bigger the tree gets, the longer it takes before it starts bearing fruit. Now, I had, for my fourth birthday, I was given a Harrelson apple tree. And I can remember planting it with my dad. And that tree lived to be over 60 years old. And, you know, I was real sad when that... <laughs> tree got split in half by a tornado and then the other half eventually died too. So when they're talking about long lifespan, I'd say 60 years is pretty long for an apple tree. A semi-dwarf gets to be at the most about 15 feet tall and they bear in less time because they're smaller. So three to five years. A dwarf is only about 10 feet tall. You can with a step ladder, you can get all the fruit on that tree. And uh, they bear in about three years, but they have a shorter lifespan. And I think we had a dwarf apple tree that only lived about 10 years. Now, I've been through the cherry orchards in Door County, Wisconsin, and all they plant is dwarf trees mm. because they're easier to harvest mm -hmm. and because they produce fruit faster. And so they're continuously, you know, pulling out their old trees that are at the end of their life cycle and replacing them with new trees. So they have this continuous uh, crop of cherries. <clears throat> now, one thing that's really, really important with um, apple, well, any kind of fruit tree, that graft on the bottom, and you can see where it is, that has to be above the ground in order to maintain the uh, type of tree that you think you're planting. <clears throat> Another really important thing is, uh, let's see, apples, pears, and persimmons all need two varieties for po pollination. Not just two trees, but two varieties. <laughs> if you have neighbors nearby that also have a fruit tree, like another apple tree, you may not need to plant too because they are pollinated by bees and through the air and everything else. But uh, if you're out lonely in the country like I am, you would need two different varieties. Uh, you also, those two varieties need to be blooming at about the same time. So there are early bloomers, mid bloomers and late bloomers. This is 2019 recommendations from SDSU Extension. You can find this online. That's what I printed it off from. And it, it tells you um, what they're resistant to, like scab, cedar, apple, rust, fire blight. It tells you uh, what season they bear fruit, how long they're starting. This is a really, really good resource. Another resource I would recommend, and you do not have to go to them to buy, but just to get information, Stark, S-T-A-R-K, is a company that sells fruit trees, but they have so much information on their website. So you can plug in your planting zone, and it will tell you which of all these different trees will survive in your planting zone so that you're not you know, planting something that you shouldn't, that will not survive here. Like a lot of peach trees won't survive here. There are some that are, you know, more likely to, but out in the country, I wouldn't even attempt it because we just, we do not have the protection that people living in town have <coughs> with all the buildings and other trees and everything around them. Uh, it will tell you, you can click on that tree and then it'll say pollinators. 
and it will tell you which other varieties would be a good pollinator for that tree. Oh. Now I have several apple trees and I have an early one and a mid one and two late ones. My <laughs> mid one will take care of either the early or the late. So their, their blooming will overlap. So, but that uh, Stark has wonderful information on there. <clears throat> and that will give, and, and they give you more information about the root stocks too. So if you wanted a semi-dwarf tree, supposedly you could go to your nursery ahead of time and tell them that you want a semi-dwarf tree and they can order it for you. They may not have it in stock, but they can order it for you ahead of time. Another really, really important thing about these trees is pruning. So you have, and it's called training. So from the time it's a young tree, you start training it so that the branches are not like this. You want them out. If you have a V in there, that's a good place for that tree to just break in half as it matures. So you start training them. You can pull those branches down, you know, those first few years so that you increase that angle. And then you don't want branches crossing over each other, rubbing each other. So you look at your tree and you trim all that stuff out of there. And you want to be able to see through your tree because you're going to have a lot less problems with disease if you get sun and wind and everything going through that tree. So again, we're talking about some work here. <laughs> Next layer is shrubs. Um, and these are generally things that have woody stems. And they may have, as you can see there in that top picture, those are honeyberries. They taste like blueberries. They do not require acid soil. They grow very well here. And um, they're bigger than a blueberry and oval shaped. You can see the, all the woody multiple stems there. <clears throat> These grow no taller than 15 feet. They don't live as long as trees, so you need to plan for succession, plan ahead, and maybe you find out, I don't like that shrub, so when it dies, I'm going to replace it with something else. They provide fruit and berries, and they provide a lot of habitat. <clears throat> they also provide a lot of food for birds. Birds love the berries. If you want the berries, you may have to net your shrubs. So I usually net to begin with, and then when I've had what I want, I take the nets off and let the birds have at it. So the bottom one is elderberry. Elderberry is one that you can't eat raw, but it makes wonderful syrups, which actually have antiviral qualities and also makes wonderful <laughs> jellies. Gooseberries, aronia berry, chopped cherry, service berry, honeyberry, elderberry, all of those are potential. I have gooseberries and they're about this tall. That's all the taller they, they get. <clears throat> What's a service berry? A uh, service berry is a, uh, it's, it's a tree-like shrub. It doesn't get all the multiple stems, so it's more like a small tree. And it's supposed to taste a little bit like a cranberry. So, birds love that one too. My daughter has a service berry and they have yet to get one to eat. <laughs> <clears throat> Honeyberries need two varieties. They have to cross-pollinate. So you can't plant one and you can't plant two of the same. Elderberries will produce fruit with one plant, but they produce more fruit and bigger fruit if you have two, so that uh, you get better pollination there. These also need pruning. 
and um, you prune out about one third of the old wood every year. And my pruning time is usually in March when you get a warm spell. You always get a warm spell in March. So then I go out there and I'm pruning my shrubs and my grapes and all that stuff. Uh, in this book, which I used extensively for this information, it's the Food Forest Handbook. And there's a chart in here that is fruit all year. And I'm going to read you just a couple from each month. May, everbearing strawberries. June, a Juneberry, a strawberry. July, raspberries, currants. August, gooseberries. Now, my gooseberries are ready in July, but it says August here. Gooseberries, uh, elderberries. September, apples, pears, grapes. October, apple, grape. November, um, it says apple, quince. I looked up quince, and you can actually grow that here. Um, it has a, I've seen a quince tree. Beautiful bright red flowers or hot pink flowers. And then it gets, it's a little pearish like pear, P E A R, fruit. So, and then it says in November also all your preserved sauces, juices, and so on. So, that's what they're talking about with the food forest. It gives you something to eat almost every month of the year. And if you freeze and can and dry, then you've got it every month of the year. You could also add beehives for pollination. You could have uh, provide like the little houses that you can get for mason bees or make your own. Uh, leave those dried hollow stems of plants in the winter time for, for bees to uh, live in. Herbaceous plants are anything that have not woody stems. So this includes your herbs, vegetables, uh, flowers, all those types of things. They can be perennials, biennials, or annuals. And you're going to raise them depending on whether they need sun or shade or whatever, where you plant them, in relation to the three areas we've already talked about. Bees are shorter. They grow from one feet to several feet tall. They require different amounts of sun, so you can find things here that you can plant in the shade of your big nut trees and your smaller uh, fruit trees. There's the most potential for diversity here just because of the wide range of plants that you can actually plant. Uh, the herbs provide flavor and health promoting compounds, and the ones I've listed here just happen to be herbs, but garlic, chives, basil, rosemary, sage, lavender, borage, parsley. Uh, the chives, of course, are perennials. Asparagus would be another perennial you could plant that's not an herb. Uh, and all the flowers, then, that you might have in your garden as pollinators. And there are a lot of flowers that you can eat. Um, nasturtiums, marigolds, pansies, chive flowers, violets, violas, calendula and squash flowers. So I have some little um, violas growing along my path coming into the house. So I went out and tasted one. And it tastes like, you know, like a salad. So wouldn't they be cute? They're like miniature pansies. Wouldn't they be cute sprinkled on your salad? But I'd be afraid to do it because I think everybody would pick out the flower and put it on their side of their plate. And then I would have picked my flower for no reason. Now, a lot of these plants can also be used medicinally, and a lot of them for teas, bee balm, lemon balm, the mint family, anise hyssop, chamomile, can all be used for teas. And if you read up on them, you know, it's some, like chamomile is one that's supposed to relax, relax you, and so they have different functions. Uh, pain relief comes from willow bark. 
And willow is also wonderful as a rooting compound. So when I'm trying to start a plant by rooting it in water, I take, I'll go out to the willow tree and cut off a little stick and stick it in the water. It starts rooting really fast. Roots. Beds, you can actually have beds for your roots because you don't want to be digging around the roots of all these other perennial plants that you've put in there. Um, so you don't want to damage those roots. You can plant on the edges of your forest or you can plant it in deep soil beds that you have created or even putting raised beds in parts of your uh, forest. Rotate these root crops with beds of green. And some, now horseradish is a perennial, but you really dig things up to get the horseradish roots because they're big and they're deep. And you know, if you want to use the horseradish, you are doing some damage to the soil in the area. Most of the roots like sunny locations um, and horseradish, potatoes, sweet potatoes, carrots, all those kinds of things. And another one that really uh, intrigued me was ramps. And you may have heard ramps if you eat, read English mysteries. <laughs> but I have all my seed catalogs here, and you can get ramps to grow here. I'm going to read you what it says. And these grow in the shade. So you could put them, and that's where they find them. In England, they go out and they hunt for them. And they dig them up under the trees. Ramps, a wild beloved member of the Allium family, are an early spring leek with bold onion and garlic flavor. They're naturally found in shady, damp woodland areas. They're a slow grower and can take two to three years to be of harvestable size. And plant in an environment that mimics a shaded, deciduous forest with leaf, leaf litter and cool, damp soil. What so, zone are they? They're, they're in zone, yeah. I read it somewhere, not right here. But they do, they do you could raise them here. Here in South Dakota. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In your forest. <laughs> so you might want to plant the ramps at the same time that you plant the um, shrubs and fiddleheads. Yeah, in the shade. Yeah, in the shade. Yeah. Ground covers. These are the short little plants that you can plant in your forest. And if you're planting them under the shade trees, you'd want to look for ground cover that tolerates shade. They decrease the amount of labor that you need to maintain everything because if you have bare soil, you will get all kinds of weeds growing there that you may not want around. And this is a good place for chickens to wander around because they will eat baby weeds, and they control insects. I wish I had more chickens around right now for all those grasshoppers that are out there. <laughs> so they add organic matter. You can mow this off and just leave the, you know, mowed off plant material laying there. You can leave the leaves in the fall and they all contribute the nutrients to the soil. They minimize weeding. Clovers are great, and alfalfa. They all add uh, nitrogen to the soil. And cool season grasses, and they will die back when the weather gets hot, and they just protect your soil, keep it from eroding, and so on. Um, so it, this adds good organic matter to, that's alfalfa fescue and red clover. Another fun one, vines. And vines can grow up onto your shrubs and trees. Um, consider the growth habit and size. Yesterday at McCrory Gardens, they have the three sisters planted there, and they had a scarlet runner bean. And it was so fun because this 
bean was vining through all their corn stalks and all these little red flowers and tiny little beans were hanging there and, and they're edible. Um, these require pruning as well, so they should be accessible to you pruning them. Now the bean would not because that's going to die off as an annual, but some of your other vines like grapes and so on. Uh, hops is a perennial that dies completely back down to the ground and comes up from the ground the next year. Now hops is used in making beer. It also makes beautiful wreaths. Hmm. Uh, my daughter has a hops vine that was there when they bought the house. And you know, out by the lake, they have a hops farm and they grow up on big, tall poles. And, uh, but they will vine along the top of a fence or up a tree or something like that too. Um, and so you could cut the vine in the fall and make these really pretty wreaths out of it because they've got those little hops, the fruit of the hops plant looks kind of like a miniature pine cone. And so they're really pretty if you make them into a wreath. Another one that I didn't include here was a hyacinth bean, and we have seeds for those here. And they are a beautiful plant. They look like a bean, but they've got pods that almost look like they're covered in purple velvet, and the flowers are little orchid-colored ones. Um, let's see. Kiwis will grow here? Yeah. Not not the fuzzy ones. Not the fuzzy ones. I'll I'll talk oh, about the okay. kiwi. Here's the hyacinth bean. It's a perennial vine, but not here. No. It's not perennial here. You have to plant them every year. Uh, heat loving, tall, attractive, purple flowers, purple pods, use on an arbor or trellis, propagate from seeds, use the young pods like string beans. Leaves like spinach, sprinkle the flowers on salad, boil fresh mature seeds until tender to remove pot toxins. So that's where the toxins come in on the hyacinth beans Somebody from the told seed. Me that you will hallucinate if you eat them when they're older. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. So we got to get them younger. Yeah. And if so, if, I would I just recommend them. not eating the, be the bean <laughs> part, the <laughs> seed at all. But, Who knows the day? Yeah, you can boil fresh, or maybe some days you want that. <laughs> <laughs> boil fresh Better mature seeds until tender to remove toxins and use in curries and soups. So that's the hyacinth bean. Kiwi. These are called hardy kiwi. Mm -hmm. Has anybody ever seen or tasted one of these? No. They do not have fuzz. And they're only about that big. It's like a big grape. But they're very tasty. And if you want to look at my pictures here, I've got another seed catalog. Is that Stark Brothers? Uh, this is Young Seeds. The hardy kiwi, zones three to seven. No peeling required to enjoy these grape-sized delicious fruits. The female kiwi, Michigan State, produces one-inch lime green fruits, rich in vitamin C with a sweet kiwi flavor. Fruits ripen in September and October. The vines usually begin bearing three to four years after planting. Mm -hmm. Requires a fence, wall, or trellis for support. A male plant will pollinate up to eight female plants. So here again, you need two, and one needs to be a male, and one needs to be a female. Does it seem how big they get? Yeah, about an inch. It's, it's like a big grape. Oh, the vine, the vine gets really big. I saw them growing in, you know, one of these arching trellises, and they had one on each side, so I suppose the male and, and the female. And they completely covered that thing. Yeah. That's the scarlet runner bean in there. So imagine them hanging from all your corn stalks. Yeah. And this is this is the hops. That's their that's their little fruit. And that and that's the hardy kiwi up at the top. That's, okay. that's what they look like. Yeah, you eat the skin and everything. 
Now, this is not one of the seven, but something that you could consider. You could consider adding some mushrooms to your food forest. And you don't just want to go out there and eat the ones that just happen to come up on their own because they might be poisonous. And you should never eat mushrooms if you are not knowledgeable about the mushrooms or have a good friend that knows a lot about mushrooms. I was just reading in the Grit magazine out here this morning about the chicken, chicken something mushrooms and they grow on trees, and they're the flat um, shelf-like mushrooms that are yellow in color and supposedly taste just like chicken. Oh, but oh. again, don't, don't try it on your own. You might not survive. Yeah, the saying that, that um, I'm familiar with through Boy Scouts is all mushrooms are edible. Some of them only once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this would be something, you, you know, get a new liver. <laughs> <laughs> you're cutting off the branches while you're pruning and you pile them up in the back part of your forest. And these are decomposers. So they like to live on things that are dead or dying, whether that's dead spots of grass in your lawn or dead tree trunks, bark, bark uh, that, that type of thing. You have to purchase the spawn, which is what the seeds are called, and that will ensure that they're safe to eat them. You, you're, you can only buy the kinds of spawn that are edible. And they like shade, and they break down the lawns and blogs, some familiar ones, shiitake lines, Maine, and oyster. And I have another seed catalog. And these are top, ta top tabletop mushroom kits. You can actually grow these in your house. I've grown, I've grown the oysters. And you're kind of fun. Yeah, I bet they would be. But you can also, and I couldn't find it in any of my catalogs, but I'm sure online you could. These come with the spawn already in logs. Um, but you could take your own logs, drill holes in them, and impregnate them with spawn if you buy just the spawn. Mm. Okay. So, I'm going to get started. <laughs> um, plant what will be most useful to you and what you like. My husband has fond memories of gooseberries from when he was a child. So he wanted to get gooseberries. I really don't like them. <laughs> um, there's something about the flavor to me that has a chemical aftertaste, but we go through the process. I do the pruning. They have thorns. You have to wear gauntlets to work with them. And then the berry, the stem stays attached, and the little part of the flower that dried up stays attached on the other end. So you take each berry and a little scissors, and you cut those two off. I mean, that's a whole lot of work for something that I don't even care for that. <laughs> <laughs> so this year, our, our gooseberries were just loaded. And so Alan helped me pick them. And then I got them all cleaned up and I froze five packages and I froze five pies. And he said, oh, but there's so many more art. There are, we better go pick them. I said, no, I think the birds can have them. We have plenty of gooseberries in the freezer. But, so that would not have been my choice for a fruit that I wanted to plant, but we have it. Start with two fruit trees, maybe, and plant in stages. Uh, you could start with a narrow strip across a fence. This is a spalier. Mm -hmm. So if you have a fence, you have to train those from the very beginning. So you would take those uh, branches and pull them out horizontally to the sides. And then as your main trunk grows, you keep doing that and uh, makes it real easy to pick, very easy to pick. 
So for the first season, and up to about four years, you're going to be planting a lot of annuals, just like you do in your garden, because you these other things aren't mature. They're not ready for you to get food from. Uh, the perennial crops in the first few years, as they start to grow, will provide shade. So that's going to, you know, make a difference in what you actually plant for annuals because you might in that tree shrub area you're going to have to plant things that don't mind at least some shade. Rotate your small crops. You might even want to replant perennials, you know, if they're not doing what you want them to, if you don't like them, like if I knew how, I would pull out the gooseberries, but <laughs> I don't know how, I can't operate the tractor. Uh, you cut back the cover crops and let all those leaves and residue just stay there to break down. This is actually a plan that I took a picture of out of my food forest book. So you can see in the back there, they've got the windbreak and the nut trees, and then they've got the fruit and berry trees, and they've got the little shrubs over here. Here's their chicken house, and you can uh, create an area for composting in another part of this. There's their house, so you see this whole thing looks pretty big. Mm -hmm. But you can make your food forest as big as you have room for. I have a farm, you know, I've got lots of space. But if you're living in town and you have just a lot, you're not going to have a huge food forest. These are where this particular uh, person has put raised beds for their herbs and vegetables and, and those types of things. So as you're planting this whole thing, think about your soil types. You can have soil tests taken. What's going to grow in sun? What's going to grow in shade? Full sun is considered at least eight hours a day of sunlight, and partial is four to six hours a day. And then the um, shade areas would be less than that. Uh, assess your site. Think of your vision. Plan for stages. You're not going to start with this whole big thing all at one time. It's going to evolve, and your plants are going to mature, and it's going to keep changing. And so you may need to change with it. And then think about some other things. Do you want to include any benches or tables or little social areas in there? That would be kind of pretty and kind of fun. Maybe you want to do something like that. Research, research, research. Go online to reputable sources like Extension, uh, seed companies, and find disease resistance as well. Um, particularly in your fruit trees, you want to make sure that they are resistant to some of those diseases so that you don't lose you lose your trees. What's your climate? In this area, we're in 4B and 5A. Right here in Yankton, it's actually 5A. That means you can plant things because you have a warmer climate. Uh, cold hardiness for 4B is minus 25 to minus 20. That's what I live in. I live in 4B. And 5A is minus 20 to minus 15, so it's about 5 degrees warmer here in Yankton. Average frost dates for 4B in the fall, the first average, 29th of September, and the last in the fall, the 6th of May. Look at the difference between 20 miles north and here. 5A is October 4th and May 2nd. But remember, those are averages. So in this goofy climate we have now, it could be completely different. <laughs> um, chill factors are winter averages, and now we have to take into account these terrific temperature fluctuations. Mm -hmm. Didn't we have some 90 degree days in May or even earlier? Mm -hmm. 
and then it got really cold again and it was cold for quite a long period of time so everything that you grew up with is now kind of ah, who knows and these temperature fluctuations are what's really hard on trees and perennials you know if it would stay cold and stay cold they tolerate that much better than these big fluctuations. Humidity affects pollination and diseases. So if you have a lot of humidity, you're more likely to have more fungal issues. Um, pollination, if it rains and rains and rains a lot during pollination, it tends to wash some of the pollen away. You may not have as good a pollination. Summer heat affects pollination. Um, the pollen dries out when it's really, really hot. And so again, you don't get as good a pollination. It affects ripening and it affects how much you have to water. Now ripening goes along with what they call growing degree days. And you're starting to hear that more on the news. They'll talk about how many growing degree days we have. So what's a growing degree day? It's your average daily temperature. So take the maximum for the day, the minimum for the day, divide it by two. That's your average. And then take that number and subtract 65 from it. And that's your growing degree day for that day. Now you can look these up online and they'll tell you how many it's been this year. So I took the first of the month from April on April 1st, we had zero growing degree days. By May, 185 and a half. June, 686. July, 1378. And the 1st of August was 2068 growing degree days. Now, my husband tells me they used to sell seed corn by, this is a 95-day corn. This is 105 day corn. They now sell it by growing degree days. So you have to keep checking, you know, go back in history. How many growing degree days do we usually have? By this Carlos, time. I still understand. How can you have 2,000 growing degree days? You do add them all together. Yep. So in April 1st, you had none. And then every month, like the 1st of May, you had 185. So where, that was- Where were those 185 days? There were not that many days in May. It's, it's, the, it's related to degrees. Temperature is related to how the plants are going to grow. Yeah, so it, it's not days, it's growing degrees in this many days. In one month's time, we accumulated 185 degrees of growing. That's that's oh. <laughs> higher I'm math. Trying to understand that because I've looked that up too, and I really don't quite understand that yet. But thank you. Well, that's the best I can do for explaining it, I guess. With climate change, we may need to select more heat and drought tolerant varieties of things that we plant. Okay, here's what we've done and are going to be doing the rest of the year in the seed library. Can you see how everything we have talked about this year relates to food forests? Everything. The theme for this year was eco-gardening, growing with your ecology and how to use it and take advantage of it and so on. So we've talked about native plants, which are adapted to your environment. We've talked about companion plants. What do you plant together that will help each other? Invasive plants that you don't want. You want to get them out of there so they don't take over what you find desirable. Pollinators, if we've got all this fruit, we need to have pollinators. Uh, Control the pests that are going to be a problem. Water conservation. You could actually put that rain garden that we talked about last month as part of your whole plan for this food forest. 
And in September, they're going to be talking about composting. So you're going to have all this plant material. Might as well turn it into compost that you could use for fertilizer uh, another year. And then in October, how do you put the garden to sleep and maintain it for another year? So it all relates to food forests. Now, some of the master gardeners have talked about at the West community gardens, there is supposedly an area of fruit trees out there. Mm -hmm. And so we've got fruit trees that are already growing and there are also some pretty tall trees out there. I haven't paid any attention to what they are, but um, we've got the start of a food forest there if we want to, you know, continue adding more of these other things. There are a number of communities that are doing this. Um, in Laverne, Minnesota, they've got one started. Brookings has a plan for a really big food forest. And I have, uh, I, I was looking on YouTube for something about food forests and there is actually an hour long YouTube presentation on the plans for that Brookings food forest. Mm -hmm. So um, Sioux Falls has some small ones. There's a church on the south side of Sioux Falls that has planted fruit trees and then they just have raised beds. So it's not all parts of the food forest, but you know, it's a start. So here's my food, food forest or forest garden. I have four apple trees, a pear tree, only one, the other one died. This one gets pears even without a pollinator, but they this was the pollinator tree, so they're not really edible. But the cows think they're wonderful. <laughs> if they see me by that pear tree, they will come running from the pasture for pears. <laughs> My three gooseberries, I have three grapevines. And then I have a vegetable, herb, and flower garden. So they're not all in one spot. But I have the parts. <laughs> any questions? Yes. So, so I guess anybody could really have that already and not know it. Yes. I mean, if you've got this, 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 it doesn't have to necessarily be set up in a, a grid type right. planting. Right. The more you were talking, I'm like, oh, I've already done that and didn't know it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, the key, th I, I don't have a nut tree, and I'm not going to live long enough to have. I, I planted an oak tree this year, but I won't live long enough to get the acorns. So... So these are some resources. Um, Project Food Forest. There's this isn't a real good website, but I picked this up from the the guy that has the food forest in Laverne, Minnesota, and just for a little information on it. So that one they're building in Brookings, who gets to eat the food out of it? Anybody who goes there and is hungry. Anybody in the community that's going to be open to anybody. And then who's going to maintain it? I don't know. I suppose they've got a plan for that. I haven't haven't checked that out. Is it out, connected but... with the college? No. Oh. It's not. They've got a big, and I don't know if they're part of it, but they've got a really big native plant thing going on in Brookings. And some of the college people are part of that, but not all of them. So I think it might be connected to that a little bit. <clears throat> hey, any other questions? Now that I started this whole food forest thing, it is everywhere. Uh, my, I'm, I'm looking at my husband's farm papers and farm magazines, and this is the Dakota farmer. And it came and here's three shrubs for an edible landscape. It's just, it's just everywhere. But, okay, any other questions? Oh, well, we should all be happy because this year we have so many weeds and some of those are edible. <laughs> <laughs> so are you eating them, Marilyn? No, I don't. No. <laughs> I'm so mad at them, I can't, couldn't eat them. <laughs> 
They're just terrible this year, the leads. I, I know, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Could you get someone um, to do a talk on the medicinal purposes of plants? I think that would be very I interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, when I at McCurry Gardens, they had little uh, lotions and salves and stuff for sale there that had some of these medicinal things in them. And uh, there was a group of people from our church that went to Chicago on a service learning trip, and they were helping with these urban farming things. They were hauling, you know, uh, compost around and all of this. And in one of those, they were taking their herbs and using them in ointments, and then they were putting them out for anybody to take, like we have the little, uh, street corner libraries here mm -hmm. they were doing that just putting these little jars and and what they were using was mostly like for muscle aches and that type of thing just things that would soothe mm -hmm. your muscles so mm -hmm. i think one of our kids was interested in getting that started but, mm -hmm. but yeah put that down for a topic for next year there you go yeah and i think we have an intern that has some insight on that I remember <laughs> she was in the kitchen. Yeah. yeah. Um, Carla, Carla, one of our interns, is in Santee, Nebraska, and she is starting a food forest at the college. She's got a little unique slant on that, and they want to plant only plants that were here pre-colonial. So their nut tree is going to be oak or hickory, you know, because those are the only nut trees that were around this area and so on. So that'll be interesting. Yeah. How does your group decide what the topic or the theme is and then the topics for each calendar year? Well, last year it started out of a book. Yeah. Yeah, we just kind of... You know, we've been going on for a long time, and as our audience, you know, you change from month to month. So we try to have something that's new but basic. You know, we don't want to get real complicated in things, and we try to do a little bit different than we've done before. So we look at the programs that we've had, and we, we've had a lot on composting, but we'll bring a little thing, a little bit different mm -hmm. views and, and attitudes towards that. And we have, you know, if you've got suggestions of things that you want to have covered, we're more than happy to look at that as options. And then we have to have people that are willing and able to do the presentations too. We don't want to do a presentation on something that we don't know anything about, although Marlis did a lot of research on this one because this is a real, this is a new and evolving topic, you know, so we want to be able to have people that can talk about it and not, you know, be making it up as we go along. <laughs> so if you've got suggestions, we're always open to those suggestions, always. These, um, you know, I don't think the library has this book. I'm, I'm a book lover, so I don't think anything of buying books. But um, edible landscaping, that's a really fun one. And there are gorgeous pictures in here. And let's see, is this, yeah, the whole back of this book is, all these plants, and like I read to you about the hyacinth being in there, they give information like that on all kinds of plants in the back of that. So that's not, it's not really food forest, but it's, you can get a lot of information. And then this one is uh, foodscaping. In uh, urban areas, they sometimes have real strict rules about what you can do with landscaping. So people there have started incorporating edibles into their pretty landscaping, kind of hiding them in there. <laughs> and uh, so that, that's kind of fun too. And there's a, 
they go through again different things and what they look like and what they'll grow with and so on so these these are just my books i don't think the library has them i have a question uh-huh do you do you i'm sorry are you local yes do you recommend that the library buy these for purchase some of yes um you know <laughs> we do and we contribute to the library and make recommendations of books that we think are useful. And then we give them money to pay for those books as well. Let me put a stamp in the front of the books that say, okay. Okay. you know, yeah, donated so, by But they Missouri. do have a concern about space. They said, you know, yeah, we the, may not have space for all these books that you want to donate. Right, so. and so that, that's a big issue with the library is shelf space. And they may be going more and more to online books. And I don't know if you all have the app that the library uses, Libby. But if you don't have it, I strongly recommend it. And I use Libby, I won't say exclusively, but I would say 90% of the books that I check out are electronic books through Libby. And it's, and it, is not only books from our library, but books from the whole area. And um, if you haven't used it, it's a great program. And and if you if they don't have books on there, you can also recommend them to purchase books. So so that that seems to be something that the library is going more for is the electronic books and they, simply because of the shelving space. They accept money for purchasing electronic books too, yeah. not just hands-on. Yeah, on that topic, they also have interloan uh -huh. libraries. So if you ask them for a book they don't have, but they work really hard to try to find it at another, um, within like countrywide, I've gotten things yeah. from as far as yeah. Three states away. Mm -hmm. it takes a little bit of time. I was afraid that on Libby, you know, being on a screen, if you have a book with lots of pictures like this, mm -hmm. that might not translate very well. So I deliberately checked out a gardening book with lots of pictures. No problem. Yeah. It was no problem. The only thing is, I have my library and I like to go back and look things up, and I like to have my my hands-on book right there with me. <laughs> Thanks, Marvin. Yeah. Very interesting.